we're going to hear from a panel to talk about all the all these subjects um, led by Dave Lyons, who is an old timer in this space. So, Dave, please take it away. Thank you so much. I need to talk to the room because the Zoom audience is not really the room. Oh, okay. Well, thank you all, and thank you, Howard. And thank you, Nick. Um, just a simple, simple background on me. Uh, I'm a, a mechanical engineer by, by training and DNA. Um, I was super fortunate to uh, I I turn, turn them on that. Start that. Company in 2004. Um, I got to hire Robert Musk uh, uh, named Musk um, and, uh, and brought on board. I led powertrain development for Tesla. 2004 through the end of 2008 for the Tesla Roadster and the uh, Tesla Model S. I was the chief engineer for that powertrain for a while. Um, I left uh, there. I, I later uh, it was an entrepreneur residence. Um, 2010, I, I met some really great guys who were uh, um, telling me they wanted to get involved with um, self-driving technology, and I was pretty much uh, um, well skeptical and, and kind of blown away. I met uh, Chris Gerdes, who's a professor at Stanford. Um, Josh Rickus, and, and uh, later we uh, co-founded a company called Peloton Technology, which um, was, I would say, we were true first movers in that space. Um, we should have been first movers in the space of making exercise equipment um, and connected us, because that was the right Peloton to found. Um, unfortunately, Peloton uh, is no longer, um, but I did spend the last 11 years uh, deeply involved in this space and uh, met a lot of really great people and watched it um, evolve from something that wasn't going to happen to uh, now what we all, I think, at least amongst the people here, will believe is already happening and, and may have already kind of gotten there. Um, and I have a great panel uh, of people today. Um, sitting on my right, I have Jeff Peters. Um, uh, and, and Jeff is with Ibex Ventures and uh, has been also deeply involved in an investor in this space for the last six years. Um, and uh, he'll tell you a bit more about that, I'm sure, along the way. Um, Alberto Stocino, who uh, I've become fast friends with in um, 2021, um, founder of Perceptive Sensing, um, Perceptive Inc. And um, he is, uh, I think, uh, developing a, a groundbreaking paradigm um, for uh, uh, the autonomy stack, sensor fusion. And, um, and we have Servera Gearman joining us virtually uh, from uh, Mitsubishi Electric. Well, I know Mimo, please, Server, tell us. Uh, what MIMO exactly stands for, so I'll get it right. Yeah, Mitsubishi Electric Mobility Ventures, MIMO Ventures. Hi, everybody. Great. So, uh, all right, thank you. Let's, let's get started. Um, so it was a November Saturday, 2005, and I sat with my young kids and we were sitting and they were like, they wanted to watch cartoons. And I was, we were watching this crazy thing on the internet um, called the DARPA Grand Challenge. And uh, we watched um, uh, our good friends at Stanford and, uh, and more David Al Ventures um, bring their car, Stanley, successfully through the course um, that uh, previously they'd, people had failed miserably the year before on. And, uh, and that really opened the door to people believing that, at least in my world, that autonomy was actually um, something that was um, possible um, uh, for vehicles. And, um, and you know, today, uh, we've seen uh, kind of, I would say, a rich and exciting and deep ecosystem form around that. Um, uh, been tremendous uh, investment, um, some pretty tremendous return on investment, and, uh, and a lot of players in, uh, and a lot of complexity. Um, but today, we haven't seen ubiquity of autonomy. And um, uh, so I'd like to learn a little bit more about um, how that's going to uh, to play out from our from our panel, um, and so uh, just to kick it off right off that, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it up. Um, the first first question is going to be uh, really directed um, at, for Alberto, but um, well, the question is whether the, we've got the autonomy recipe right. Is, is it all we need to do is work harder to execute, or are there some fundamental problems still unsolved? Yeah, that's. Uh... That's really another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as you said, actually, uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge set the tone, set the approach, the main framework to actually to work on autonomy. And it's been working that way for the past, you know, 16 years since uh, 2005. And I mean, we have it. 
we have it today. I mean, you see Waymo now scaling even to New York, right? That works to some extent. And, but it, we're still in the, um, in this linear regime where um, scaling capabilities, scaling deployment is still very much a matter of brute force, right? Uh, and it was like the gist, it was the essence of the DARPA Grand Challenge, it was a lot of brute force, heroical, like admirable, but now we're thinking, okay, we have it, we got a taste of it, we want more of it, we want it to be smarter, uh, we want it really to take it everywhere fast. And, and so, some for the first generation people have operated under the assumption that that framework is correct and we just have to continue and just work harder at it but you know at some point you start you keep working harder at it and for every extra square mile that you add to your geofence data you have to hire a certain number of people so you realize that that something is not scalable it's not working no, so something is amiss and so uh, rather than continuing in to optimize that approach, we actually should rethink of it in a, in a, in a better way. Um, so I think this is actually the time where we should think about, you know, autonomy 2.0, where we really think about scalability of, of performance and, um, and, and, and deployment. So the, the recipe in place is not really right in that sense. So the, the approach in the architecture today is not well suited to do that. And so I, I think it's actually, um, that's the shift that what needs to happen. It's not just doing more of the same. It's not just about doing more compute, more hardware, uh, just more mileage. I think if you start having, if the solution to your problem is that you need to now train for hundreds of millions of miles, uh, something is not working, right? It's a good like uh, red flag. Thanks. Well, that's great. And uh, Server, what are your thoughts on that matter? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I agree with Alberto and um, well, I think um, starting full-fledged autonomy with uh, kind of that works everywhere in, in any scenario, in any location is kind of insane, right? Like why would we want to wait until that point to get there? And I think um, LSAT, uh, low speed autonomous driving will be one of the early adopters in the space and we see more regulation coming into space. First ISO regulation was released this summer for safety standards. And um, I think, I mean, before we see LSAT applications from construction to mining to yards, like we see all these simple repetitive tasks around from vehicles that are around us and that are still operated by drivers today. Uh, like I, I find kind of I find hard time believing we can scale um, public autonomy in kind of limitless autonomy without actually scaling that kind of autonomy in kind of uh, construction areas, mining spots, uh, yards, warehouses, and so on. And we see, we see pilots in space, but we still see the scaling problem. And we are kind of asking ourselves, uh, why is that happening and how can we accelerate that? But that's kind of the focus uh, on our side for now, like how do we actually bring focus on a vertical specific application and how do we solve the problem for that specific vertical and then scale from there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because autonomy is like a, uh, enabling technology, but what use case or business case is it actually solving? So back to, is the recipe right? You could argue that the recipe is right uh, for construction, mining, agricultural use cases where actually, you know, there's millions of autonomous miles today in mining um, from several different OEMs. Um, so in that case, recipe is right, but for the public roads, for other use cases, um, probably needs a couple more iterations. Thanks. Um, so when I think, so we've interesting you bring up uh, some of these like off highway and, and agriculture applications. Um, ones I, I hear the most about are, you know, kind of much more public facing, but uh, you know, in my neighborhood, I see neuro cars every day. Um, so kind of last mile delivery. Um, Long haul freight is certainly something that like people like Aurora or Waymo have really spent a lot of time discussing. Um, we've got robo taxis with the Zooks of the world. Um, we've got, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, Tesla and their full self-driving um, and so kind of personal, personally owned cars. Um, if you were to look at those, um, where, where do you feel the fertile ground is for um, a more mass market? Um, kind of con maybe consumer-facing um, solution and autonomy. Jeff, 
Any thoughts on that? I've only invested in off-highway autonomy thus far. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> um, so the thesis that, that I've had and um, my partners have had um, is that personal or, yeah, I guess uh, personal AV or personal car AV, even long haul mm -hmm. trucking remains uh, elusive and somewhat far away. You know, typical venture capital funds of a 10 year lifetime and you know, maybe we're approaching where that might make sense and you might actually see dollars and, and revenue uh, manifest. Um, it's still a long way away. So where I've spent most of my time is off highway. Um, so lead investments in autonomous construction mining and lead investments in agriculture where those are actually making millions of dollars in revenue today and a pretty massive market overall. You know, you see labor savings where we're seeing a labor shortage, but also labor, labor certainty um, where there is labor uncertainty today. Um, as well as you can actually increase increase production for the, these these customers. Um, so that's that's existing today and can be big companies, durable companies for the future. Where I, I still maybe I'm um, I don't know stubborn, um, but I, I do see the the real business use cases for passenger car AV, um, even anything that has to go on on a road as being pretty far away from meaningful scale. Um, that you have to rely on, you know, going public with zero revenues um, and, and hoping that, you know, that that stays afloat until your, your lockup period ends from a financing perspective. Um, <laughs> um, so there has been a Big lot of switch, returns, yeah. um, but, you know, I, I, um, I, I think those consumer facing use cases are still a ways away okay. as it relates to on road. But maybe, you know, you can have autonomous robots delivering you meals in your hotel. <laughs> okay, um, server, um, on that same investor thesis kind of question, do you have any thoughts there from uh, the corporate side? Yeah, we, I mean, we think any kind of limited scenario, geofence application is a candidate for that. Um, yards are certainly a place where um, a lot of repetitive actions happen, and you can actually predict what's going to happen around those vehicles. Uh, airports, uh, last mile delivery solutions, indoor, not necessarily outdoor immediately, but indoor, as Jeff mentioned, th those are candidates. Uh, I mean, I keep asking myself, why does it still, still a manual truck uh, pushes back a plane today on an airport? Uh, that's a candidate, right? So, so all these, all these markets, and, and again, we, we let the market lead us. We wanna see more startups in the space uh, because it's it's more measurable, it's more predictable, and we sit, we think regulators are also more keen on letting these kind of applications happen in their um, in their space. So um, all of them could be a candidate. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Alberto, any thoughts? Um, I I see a separation between these automations, like you're talking about off highway agriculture, airport. That's great. The technology is here today. It's almost like a different business. Um, and it's a, almost like a, it's a market, you can sell it, you can already sell a unit. That doesn't mean that we should just give up on autonomy at all. Actually, autonomy is, and passenger autonomy and goods autonomy, first, the demand is huge. It's gargantuan. Like even just this month, I hear about like a, a shortage of 80,000 truck drivers, and, and that is just gonna increase and get bigger and bigger. So that pressure is gonna grow. And so the demand and the need and the pressure to, to develop this is just gonna grow exponentially. It's sort of like a bottleneck of the entire economy, if you think about it. So goods transportation. And, and then I see, yeah, when you actually develop these very narrow specialized solutions, um, they, they never really grow. Like, again, you develop like your airport, you know, machine that pulls the airplane on the tarmac is never, that's never gonna become a level five car. So um, it, it's not, oh, this is the first step towards there. Sort of like it's a different, a different solution. Um, and I think, okay, maybe that four years ago was not that clear, but by now that the separation is very, very clear to everyone, even just the separation between level two and four, like now everyone understands that. Um, and the rest, level four, and those, those, those things, we do have them. I mean, people dismiss it sometimes because you, you see these public demos and it seem about the same that they were like five years ago, but under the hood, they're very different. The reliability, the robustness of the solution, the number of nines after 99% of reliability that they have, like maybe you don't see with your eyes, but it shows up in, in, the, in the miles. Um, so that's very encouraging. It should be all the opposite, not discouraging. It's not like we're not, it's very encouraging. Now, how can we get more and faster, right? How can we do this not in the next 10 years, but how can we do it in the next five? I mean, how can we really get faster, right? Um, 
So that that's how I see sort of the space. But I mean, if you ask today, tracking people will pay like premium to move goods in and volume. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, so oh. um, here's, a, here's an interesting little story. I um, I found myself in Chandler, Arizona, in, in um, late uh, August this past year, and I knew that they had this Waymo um, ride sharing um, opportunity there, and I. Uh, I, I downloaded the app and I had also heard they had no drivers in the car. So I was like, well, I, I certainly want to do that. And by the way, I've been in these demos now for like what, a decade <laughs> of, of these kinds of things. So I got in a Waymo car at a Walgreens in, in Chandler um, off of Kyrene Road. And um, within three minutes of that, first of all, there was a safety driver in the car when, it, when, the, when the van Pacific showed up. Um, within three minutes, we're driving down the left-hand lane on front road, much like El Camino. Um, and cars are passing us on the right-hand side because we're doing the speed limit. No one else is. And um, somebody, and I'm watching their beautiful renderings uh, and, and the car. And it was like, I'm videoing and it's pretty cool. I was like, I go, this is pretty cool. Two and a half minutes into it. Um, third minute, um, some guy on the right-hand side comes up from behind, uh, from behind on our right and just cuts us off. And the safety driver immediately has to grab the wheel. We've got red sims every and um, and 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 he doesn't say a word. But uh, we're I was I was like, well, you know, I didn't feel like I was in trouble, like I was going to get I, I was I was unsafe. But again, I, I didn't feel the same about autonomy as I did the lat and, and way I was preaching about autonomy prior to that. And by the way, the second ride home, I took like I went 15 minutes out and 15 minutes back into the car. I also had a safety driver had to take over. It was not a safety issue though. They, they, the car just got yeah. lost. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on my experience? Am I are we are we there? <laughs> like, have, have we have we somehow? Uh, I mean, am I am I just uh, just have bad luck, or is autonomy ready? You know, there's there's cases, I and mean, this is your experience, but there's a bunch of stories of people taking these demos and getting really excited. Oh, yeah, but wait, this isn't demo. I paid money for this. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Okay, good. Yeah. But they go right. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that yeah. they are collecting revenue. Um, and you know, my point, last point's moved. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, you also hear stories of people entering these vehicles and then three minutes go by and they're bored out of their mind. They're like, this isn't even exciting anymore. I'm just in a car riding around. I might as well be in an Uber. And that speaks to, you know, the, the promise that, you know, this, this holds is that, you know, it'll just become, you know, the forgotten industry going forward because it's so ubiquitous in our lives. And so you have one experience, hopefully that fades with time. And maybe, you know, that safety driver didn't really need to grab the steering wheel. He just, you know, feared for your life at that moment. <laughs> um, but, you know, as these become boring, we'll forget about it and it'll just become normal. Um, and I think you've already seen people take some of these demos yeah. or, or go in those Waymo cars and just be like, yeah, okay, that was exciting when I first stepped in, but not anymore. And it'll be a forgotten industry just like, Transportation is largely today outside okay. of self-driving cars. Anybody else? I, I feel like that that accident you had, Dave, is probably the perfect example of actually where the problems are today with autonomy. Is that this everything is new? Like you think there was like an easy predictable situation, but to a car that is just being instructed with a lot of like a list of things to do. Oh, if this, this is the situation, do this. If this is the situation, do that that doesn't scale that's the approach there's no like that list is like bottomless right and uh, and i think that's exactly where we're at today all the situation they need to be prescribed and pre-thought in advance and you can never solve the problem really intelligently what we need to have is a system that is able to really generalize that you don't have to actually encounter every single possible situation it could be in to uh, determine how to move and to operate and this is exactly where are today. This generalization, it's not there today. It's all done by hand manually. And that's really actually why they expand by a number of square miles. They have to add a certain number of people per square mile in the ops of these teams. And I mean, that doesn't work. What you wanna have is like, still, still be like when you're raising a child, you don't teach them how to behave in every situation in life. You wanna just give them values or principles and let them figure out how to do it on the world, right? <laughs> I think that, that's a gap that we don't have today, and that's where we're at. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, real quick, I'm moving on. Um, simple question: Do we have a complete suite of hardware today to do to do what we need? No, <laughs> no, we don't. Um, 
Yeah, exactly. That goes back to your first question about do we have the recipe right? No, no, no. Like it, it, we need different hardware. We need to really be able hardware enables uh, this kind of intelligence, this kind of like AI ability to generalize. That's why we need to generalize from few examples from the particular to the general really fast. And that smart is not in the hardware today. It's not possible. Um, and, and that's what it's missing. That's the problem. Anything else is like a stock up solution that's trying to do it by brute force. And it, it, it works like brute force does it, but you, know, you, can, you only have so much brute force, right? At some point you run out of it. Feel free to use as much as you have and it's gonna cost you, but at some point you even run out of that. And what do you do, right? And so new hardware is needed for this. Well, new hardware to enable new types of software. So the solution is gonna be a software solution, but the hardware needs to enable that. And we saw that in some of the presentations already today, right? Um, with OWL and, and others, but so is this, and, uh, and yeah. Maybe my, my two cents on that. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah, is, well, I think this is like, I, I keep watching the industry talking about like, do we need LiDAR? Do we need camera? Do we need radar? And this reminds me early day smartphone conversations on, do we need a camera on, on, the, on the phone? Do we need a LiDAR on the phone? Do we need a flashlight on the phone and, and so on? I, I think thinking about hardware, again, without thinking about the vertical specific application is, is just, uh, kind of a loop in this like we different applications will require different hardware and we are we also believe that uh, not every vehicle needs to have same kind of um, compute power sensing power uh, we think it's going to be easier to scale if the infrastructure also gets smart we invest a lot in that too some some parts of the action could easily be handled by the infrastructure today if it was smart enough uh, so, so we have to think about, again, we cannot just have a generic idea of an autonomous vehicle in mind and try to get there as the entire industry. Uh, we, we really need to think about our application. Uh, this this kind of came to us when we incubated a startup this year uh, throughout the summer on bringing AV to wildfire tech, for example. Um, and over there, we, we realized, well, you know what? An AV hardware requirement for a vehicle that operates in wildfire environment is completely different than anything is out there today. Like if you, if you rely on complete vision on that environment, you, you're done. Like you're gonna get into that smog and you're not gonna be able to see anything. So that's kind of the vertical focus that I'm, I'm kind of uh, talking about from the beginning that I think will uh, sort of uh, enforce the prescription of the hardware going forward. Thank you, That's really good. Um, so, you know, obviously this is a steeplechase race and there's a lot of, lot of hurdles um, and it's a very long race. Um, we've talked about technology hurdles here, but I'm sure there's others that we need to be in the conversation about regarding um, social, uh, regulatory and uh, economic. Um, Jeff, what are your thoughts on the other types of hurdles that we face um, outside of technology? Mm, that's a, it's a good question. Um, regulation obviously plays a, a pretty big role um, in either protecting you know, people or, or throttling deployment, however you want to look at it. Um, I think you know, people often, the, the thing that I'll push back on like is, I guess, labor, right? I mean, there's a the, the big concern of you know, truck drivers, I think transportation or, or drivers is the, the largest uh, job segment in like 40 of the 50 states or something like this. So, you know, it stands to reason that, you know, if you have autonomous vehicles doing everything, all those folks will be out of work. Um, and people cite that, but, you know, I, I think I think that part is overblown. Um, I think, you know, the, the rollout won't happen swiftly overnight. People will find other jobs. There already is a shortage of drivers. It's not the most illustrious line of work. Um, so I think some of the labor concerns around autonomy are a little bit overblown. Um, so I just kind of talked about a problem I just created and then yeah. said no, but <laughs> um, that is something often cited um, as a detriment of autonomy that I think okay. um, just stands to, um, shouldn't be an impediment. Okay, great. Server, um, Fundamentally, these, all these autonomous technologies are not cheap. Um, and they're certainly, they're talking about them coming down the curves. What, what about the economics of autonomy? Um, let's, what are your thoughts there? Well, um, as I said, I think 
for commercial applications, it will always make sense. Right, and I don't think we need to discuss uh, specific costs of a lidar or something else when you have a robotaxi operating 724. Uh, but if you want to bring down a $35,000 average car to fully autonomous status, then then you do have cost concerns, right? And I think the smaller the model of transport gets, if you have autonomous robots working in a warehouse, it definitely doesn't make sense to put in a $15,000 LiDAR in them. So our thesis is the smaller the form gets, uh, the more infrastructure uh, smartness you need in the system. And there comes in like 5G or a roadside unit like solutions that we also provide. I think that those kind of things uh, will enable autonomy in, in smaller form factors that for for uh, cost sensitive uh, modes of transport. I also just echo the point you made earlier. Um, I mean, transportation it has infinite demand, right? If, if cost wasn't a factor, it'd be really awesome to teleport to anywhere in the world right now. I think it will always have infinite demand. So anything that helps make that more efficient, more cost effective, it's going to increase economic output overall. Yeah. Um, and, you know, utility for consumers around the world. Yeah, that, that was Joe Ben's point earlier this morning, right? So, yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, I think one of the challenges is um, we're talking about narrow solutions, geofence, sort of ultra well specialized for a specific user case. Those are really difficult to scale. Also, uh, the economics are difficult to sustain. Eventually, what people want is just a, something that takes you from A to B. If you start actually having like, okay, just a service that only takes you on the freeway and then drops you off and then you have to do these out of five things before you get to B, right? It doesn't help, you know? People just wanna have the problem, they wanna get to a point, a point, right? That's what it will pay. I think the economics will change. If we chop up and we really restrict the problem, we're really not gonna make a compelling product. And so, you know, um, you know, think of like, I mean, I come from Apple, eh? so I have a little bit of bias, but the beauty of Apple products is just, just work for everyone. You know, they were super successful. An iPad was successful because even your grandma could just turn it on, it just works. There was nothing else needed to make it work, right? Um, and so I don't think actually, even if you, you say, oh, I can solve this freeway, I can just solve the local neighborhood, I can solve in the geofence, I think they're not gonna move out. It's gonna be difficult to, to, to develop a business model that's actually sustainable for those. Yeah. Um, I'd love to bring um, the uh, faction team here into the teleoperations question on that respect. Um, we're, we're happy to participate. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm oh, surprised, no. but please, do you have a microphone? So I, 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 love, I love these kind of conversations because uh, prior to starting Faction, I was VP of engineering at Starsky Robotics, where we were running driverless semi-trucks on public roads here in the United States. And we did it a combination of autonomy with teleoperation, because if you actually look at the curves, so the computers are really good at doing stuff that the humans get tired and bored and cause problems with. And humans are really good at unblocking the computers at the things you could go spend a billion dollars of AI research on. And so we take a similar approach here at Faction, which we're going after um, markets where you pick on fair fights, but it is combining that autonomy with teleoperation to actually bridge through waiting for the, the day that we someday might get 100% AI driving, which I also agree is a number of years off. So. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to change the topic up a little bit. Um, I want to talk about kind of, uh, we have a lot of people in aviation um, in today's conversation. Um, what are the lessons that ground-based autonomy development are gonna bring into um, aviation autonomy? Do you think what's applicable and, and what's, what's not? We already heard in the kind of the IMU world that uh, the, the level of complexity um, involved in that is gonna be higher um, than it is on ground-based. Any, any thoughts on lessons from uh, ground-based autonomy into uh, uh, aviation autonomy? I think what Joe Ben was saying, exactly getting to from A to B, that's, that's a big added value. And right now, yeah, you take an airplane, but you still often spend more time getting to the airport, getting out of the airport. So really having the full solution, there will be, from the technology point of view, yeah, you need to be able to districate, get out of yourself from urban areas, from like a rooftop and land anywhere, right? And uh, collision avoidance, as soon as it's gonna start filling up the sky. So you're not gonna have like a tower controlling traffic. So these vehicles need to be able to get around themselves and then to collide. 
Um, so those are the challenges. Um, and autonomy in that case is also essential. There are not that many pilots. If, if everyone starts to have a, like <laughs> a little helicopter, I don't think there's enough <laughs> helicopter. Pilots. Talking about labor shortage, right? Yeah. <laughs> And that'd be a skilled labor shortage for sure. Uh, maybe, oh, sorry. Yeah, maybe one comment. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in that industry, but I kept what kind of wondering as this is like exactly what we described, like a limited scenario. You're taking off, you're landing, and you know where to go, and most of it is already automated. So why don't we see more autonomous airplanes, right, on, on the skies already? And I, I did actually ask my friends around who works at Airbus as engineers and, and I think the main input was, well, uh, first, the focus of the industry is to be able to operate with one pilot, and, and that requires autonomous landing solutions uh, capabilities, and uh, that needs to be uh, tested and validated. And currently, it, it, most of the planes rely on ILS to land, and it's, it's an infrastructure-based solution, and it doesn't exist in every airport. So um, actually, the industry is taking the fleet learning and onboard compute uh, solutions and implementing it nowadays. And, and executives in industry are finally uh, funneling some money post pandemic into development of onboard uh, machine learning and compute systems on airplanes so that uh, they could be able to land autonomously without relying on infrastructure. Uh, that's kind of the carryover nowadays, as I'm learning also, by the way. Thank you. Jeff. No, I think Howard. Oh, sorry, Howard. Sorry, I, I used to run the Amazon Prime drone program, and of course it's autonomous, you know, no pilot, no air traffic, it's all in, inherent in the aircraft. And one, I always sort of was a little confused by the direction that aerospace takes, which is you have to prove that the system uh, will work continuously. There's no chance of stopping and waiting for something, right? It really has to operate at extremely high levels of reliability. And the concept of sensor fusion, sense and avoid is also, built in, right? Airplanes today do have sense and avoid. They just, pilot is one of these things, but not the only part, right? There's strategic sense and avoid with air traffic management, there's radars, weather radars on the airplane to make sure you don't fly in, you know, into the wrong weather pattern. Uh, these capabilities actually exist. And when you guys fly in a commercial airplane today, uh, the average time that the pilot is flying the plane in an Airbus is three and a half minutes, in Boeing is seven minutes. And this plane, you know, usually the fl flights are five to eight hours. So most of the time, this airplane is autonomous. And I actually am way more interested in lessons of aerospace, where we managed to build extremely dependable systems into uh, sort of own transportation versus the other way around. I don't want airplanes to be as reliable as cars, regardless if they're self-driving or not. I want cars to be as reliable as airplanes. I, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, other questions from the floor? I'm sorry, here. Thank you. So the, the question is, uh, over all these years, we've been talking about how to introduce more intelligence to the vehicle. And I'm wondering why we're not rethinking about redistributing that intelligence between infrastructure, somewhere in the middle, whatever that is, digital platform or whatever, and vehicle. I mean, today, if you look at all of the efforts to create autonomous vehicles, whether it is from the hardware perspective or the software perspective, is to put more and more intelligence to the vehicle to make sure that it deals with all of these situations, right? Even the experience that you've had uh, in uh, Chandler. Uh, so we have essentially dumb roads and smart, super smart vehicles. Yeah. So I'm wondering if, if the, the panel has thought about what it will mean to redistribute that intelligence that is necessary and make intelligent infrastructure to some extent uh, and uh, then intel still intelligent vehicles, but, but still not, not like balancing, having the kind of balance that we have today, which is 100% and zero. Sure. If you don't mind, I'd like to jump in because this comes back to like, so 1993, I believe it was, Congress uh, passed a bill um, called the Intelligent Highway Initiative, and then they focused on um, autonomy. Um, and they did some giant demonstrations um, that were very, very impressive in San Diego in 1995 and 1996. 
Um, and, and a lot of what we see today kind of has some roots in what, in what was done there. That was almost completely infrastructure focused. And if you remember, there wasn't a whole hell of a lot going on like 1999, 98, because infrastructure, well, and I know that, you know, here we are uh, just this week, we passed the infrastructure bill, um, but certainly didn't come easy, did it? Um, and uh, it wasn't easy for the last administration either. Um, but uh, I, I really worry that infrastructure-based solutions will just take forever. And ultimately then the government picks a winner. So I, I personally, and just and from my experience, I believe that the, uh, we, we need to find infrastructure-less solutions um, that can actually drive adoption to what meets the, um, the market demands um, rather than things that are being brought in. DSRC for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. We built the company for 10 years on that, which, by the way, is dead. Um, and uh, that's, that's not, it wasn't, that wasn't a big winner. I, I'm, I'm anti-infrastructure uh, for autonomy personally. Yeah. I'd love to hear more. Yeah, I consulted for the U.S. Congress at one point on positive train control. Um, past, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> when is that going to happen? Like 2007, I think, you know, law was passed because there's a big train accident. So we're going to have positive train control so that to mitigate these accidents going forward. This technology needs to be on all railroads by 2012. Well, it's 2021 today, and I don't even know what single digit percentage it's deployed on. Um, maybe it's into the double digits right now. Um, <laughs> that's a classic example, Jeff. I mean, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Like, it's a 2D problem. There's no, I mean, it's a 1D problem, really, on the, on the, yeah. on the rail, right? The, the, the thing's not going to, unless so, it goes too fast, it's not going to come off the rail. So the, the fact that, like, you have to deploy an infrastructure largely owned by municipalities, in some case, individual municipalities, really limits the scale that, you know, we're, we're, you really want for a solution that, that just works. Um, so if you have to rely on infrastructure, um, it becomes a really tough um, sale when you talk about, you know, autonomy everywhere. That being said, you know, again, always going back to the commercial use cases, um, they, they do deploy additional infrastructure to, to help those, um, those use cases perform. But when you talk about scaling personal autonomous vehicles, it really becomes uh, a major hurdle uh, to scale. Albert? Yeah, I agree. As you said, I think at some point people figured out it was easier to invent general artificial intelligence than to change in the government. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. And then actually, let's not understand, only maybe 20% of the effort is to follow the road of infrastructure. That's the easy part. The challenge is the agents. That's where the unpredictability is. It's the pedestrian, the other cars, how to interact with each other, how to interact with you, how you actually complicate all this. Uh, following the road, I mean, if that's what kind of Tesla does these days, you know, and following the road, see the contours, following the lines, the, the traffic lights, it, it, that's not the hardest part. We already know how to do that pretty well. It's a randomness in it. It's a human is that they complicate it. So I have a question on that then. Since, Please. Uh, because I, I, I think there, there may be different opinions on this issue. And maybe there's in something in between. But um, for example, I have an investment in a startup called Dirk. I don't know if you've heard of them. But they, their, their proposition, their thesis, is that to, to have better self-driving better self autonomy, you really do need to have infrastructure that makes the car or the vehicles uh, smarter to look around corners, right? Because there's only so much that you can get inside the, the sensors inside a vehicle and other vehicles. And so, if, so they're going around uh, getting municipalities to install smart traffic um, uh, equipment, right? Uh, claiming that that actually is going to solve a lot of um, education problems with safety and, and solve a lot of other problems beyond autonomy as well. Um, but so isn't there some intermediate um, answer? I mean, maybe this is addressing your point, Evangelos, which is, and that's not a federal government initiative, by the way. Those are municipalities. These are, these are people that make decisions at the very local level, have budgets to already to buy traffic equipment. So they just have to buy a different kind of traffic yep. equipment, right? So isn't that a partial solution to the question? Yeah. It's not an all or nothing, yeah, I guess. Is my no, yeah, no, that's, that's like a distributed kind of solution to this, right, as opposed to a centralized solution. And, and certainly sounds, sounds promising, right? Yeah. No, but the, the, yeah, we, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Please, server. <laughs> yeah, the, just maybe another angle here is, uh, I think um, for, for infrastructure-enabled solutions, you need a multi-sided market. And uh, single investors or corporations are not doing a great job at creating multi-sided markets. 
we all attack the problem from our own perspective with our own strengths and we solve only a piece of that. And then the others solve the other piece and all the money goes in. Uh, hence, again, going back to my topic of focusing on the vertical and enabling an end-to-end -end solution with industry players from the get-go. Uh, there, there needs to be, uh, of course, working groups to create uh, kind of protocols for communication and uh, all the other baseline uh, infrastructure requirements. But we also need to create uh, ventures and initiatives together that solves a problem end to end. And I think that's the only way to deploy an infrastructure enabled solution at this phase if you're going to do it in a private way. Okay. More questions? Please. I guess as a follow on to Howard's question, um, how dependent are you on? on essentially every local government in the country being competent at building infrastructure. When I come down uh, Highway 1 to come here, there's a real nice white line on this side of the road and there's a clearly marked center line. And I'm from Boston. And often there's no white line on the right hand side of the road and the, the line down the middle is kind of faded and broken. Uh, do, do you have to come up with a solution that deals with completely incompetent local governments too? Is, 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 they can be incompetent but out of money. You know? Is autonomy <laughs> dependent on that? I mean, it can now depend on that. Um, and maybe also on what our was saying, definitely the infrastructure will make a big difference, will simplify the problem a lot. But then I think you go back on what I was saying before about having this narrow product. Now your solution only works within that infrastructure and then you have a narrow product, then how does it reach out? How does it go out? And again, now you're focusing, you need to have a really general solution to justify the economics. Um, th that said, the infrastructure really help. I think, one day, maybe we're going to stop thinking about driving as a human-centric and they we're going to design it in a different way, like a robot will draw it. Um, but I think in a really long foreseeable future, I think it will still be kind of along the ways that we do it today. At the scale, you need to be able to operate in exactly that unknown environment. Um, there's, I think it was something a couple of years ago, someone just drew like a double yellow line around a, a vehicle. And then it was stuck there, right? <laughs> That's more of a joke yeah. than reality, but <laughs> um, you know, you could have some adversarial effects without some um, extra intelligence. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Please. Yeah, can I just make an infrastructure comment? And that is, um, if we just look at the telecommunications market today, right? And you look at 4G, you know, forget about 5G right now. If you just look at 4G coverage in the US infrastructure, Total in terms of the geographical areas, it's less than eight eight percent coverage in the eight, US. Like zero eight. eight. That's geographic. Yeah. What about that's population? Yeah, that's right. Growth. So my point is that when it comes to driving, if we adopt the same type of infrastructure-based solution, right, it'll inevitably start to look like uh, population density-driven solutions. Sure. Okay. And to Alberto's point, you're not going to get that. One more. One more question, please. Uh, one, can you put the microphone back? Yeah, well, just continue on that comment. And um, the word is not only United States. <laughs> so even though we are struggling with infrastructure investment here, but there are lots of countries in this world that they're investing a lot into infrastructure. Because on the autonomy, there are like different approach on this as well. Like, so I've, I've been working in the auto industry for the past 15 years, right? So if we look at one class of the um, autonomous approach was just, okay, we're gonna do a mathematical calculation on human lives means if someone dies, how much we need to pay for that, right? We factor that in and we have a business model. The other approach is we need to save every single life we can save. If it's not safe, we're not gonna deploy it. And if you are in that group of thoughts, then infrastructure investment worth every penny 
but that doesn't uh, translate into uh, economic return with a VC model. So you need to have someone who actually factor into human life to the max value that they can value it and also have a long-term approach to it, right? Um, like China is spending a lot on the V2X, means uh, vehicle to or infrastructure communication, sensor, sensors, communication um, parts on the road. And they're taking a long-term approach. They, they, like I've seen their internal document from the government and they were just like, okay, we won't see any return in the next 20 years, but we're gonna put money into that because that's how we can get autonomy onto the road as fast as we can, as safe as we can. Right, that approach probably not going to work for the U.S. Uh, uh, market, but it might work with some European market as well, because I've seen um, German uh, uh, government uh, investment plan and also French investment planning to these segments. So I wouldn't give a clean cut into like whether it will work or not. I think it's it, it's probably um, a different approach with different market. Um, but still, there is a lot of benefit to have the sensor on the road, because um, as Howard said, that some simple sensor can increase um, the safety and the efficiency by a lot. So I used to work for a Siemens uh, railway signaling system, and by putting some active sensor on the railway, it actually can help the um, safety by a lot. It's just that in America, we are not spending money on that. Fair enough, and I stand corrected on my uh, infrastructural uh, uh, negativity earlier. That is truly a United States focused view. And I, I believe that in other worlds where you have a, a different level of ability to have a collective society change, um, that, that actually, you know, infrastructural solutions, I believe personally do make sense. I just don't have a whole lot of promise myself on a centralized government solution in the United States. That's true, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.